Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Brianne Sanchez, Director of Nonprofit Relations at the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, and I would like to welcome you to our training this afternoon, Understanding State and Federal Assistance Programs for Nonprofits. A sincere thanks to Carrie McCann Butel at the Iowa Council of Foundations for their leadership in co hosting this session. We appreciate your time and participation, especially in this ever evolving environment with the COVID 19 virus. As nonprofit organizations, many on the front lines helping community members access resources, we want you to know how much we appreciate all it is that you're doing during this challenging time. Our goal is to share how nonprofits in Iowa can better understand recent legislation designed to help nonprofit organizations weather the COVID-19 crisis. As a reminder, the information shared in this session should not be considered financial or legal advice. Before we, wanted, we get started today, I want to cover a few basic housekeeping items that will help facilitate our time together. Um, and I am aware that we have reached a cap that we were not expecting. Um, we had uh, more than 500 people express interest today. So um, we'll be trying to troubleshoot to let more people in on the session, but we will be sending out a recording um, after immediately after the fact. So if you have folks on your team who are struggling to get in, just know that um, we're working on it and we'll be able to disperse this information um, more broadly after after the session. So for Q&A, uh, you should have a Q&A bubble here um, on your uh, screen. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into that function. This function also, it does allow you to ask questions anonymously. Uh, Carrie and I will be lifting up questions that come through to our panelists and we'll reserve time at the end of the session for, uh, for additional questions. Uh, with so many participants, we might not be able to get to every question, but we'll cover as many as possible. Um, and then uh, lastly, if you need technical help or have a resource to share, you can use the chat box. Um, but we'd like to keep the chatter to a minimum, um, just so that it won't be distracting to the rest of the folks, um, especially users who might be joining us from their phones. So with that, I'll pass, uh, that I'll pass to Carrie, President at the Iowa Council of Foundations, who will introduce our panelists for today. Carrie? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to Brianne and the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines for their partnership on the webinar today. Um, as she mentioned, we appreciate the podcast, so we are um, hoping to get this information as quickly as possible to others. Um, with the number of people that have expressed interest in the webinar, it's quite clear that this information is a top of mind for both at the moment and we are really uh, looking forward to getting this so folks can start taking advantage of programs. Um, we will not be able to get into all of the technical aspects of the program today. Uh, so we will be sharing out a recording to the National Council of webinar that was hosted earlier this week. They got down into the nuts and bolts, specifically into elements of the CARES Act that are available for the nonprofits. So um, we'll be sharing that along with the slides. Joining us today, we have um, four panelists. First, we'll hear from Ryan West and Nicholas Oliviencia from Iowa Workforce Development, who will share an overview of the state assistance programs available for nonprofit organizations through Iowa Workforce Development. Then we'll hear from Lynn Gommer, Senior Gift Planning Consultant with the Spelter Company who will address how CARES Act provisions might impact charitable giving and offer suggestions on communicating new opportunities to donors. And finally, we'll hear from Angela Reed, partner and CPA at Tarbell & Co. She will be sharing insights about the CARES Act and how nonprofit leaders might work with their boards and their banks to leverage these opportunities. Um, I'm getting a couple notes that my audio is not coming through very clearly. I apologize for that. Um, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Ryan to get started and, and see what I can do to troubleshoot my audio. Ryan, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Carrie, and hello, everybody. Thank you for having me on. My name is Ryan West. I don't think uh, Nick was able to get through, uh, but that's okay. If I can't address some of the questions, I'll make sure to get the answers and get them back out to Carrie and her team. I appreciate everybody's time. 
this is uh, uh, obviously a, a, an odd uh, set of circumstances that we're under and uh, the landscape of all of this seems to change on a kind of an hourly basis. What I was hoping to do um, was give an overview of kind of where we're at right now. Some of you may have already heard uh, some of this. We've done um, a few employer PowerPoints uh, or webinars um, over the last week or two and we'll certainly have more into next week. So where we stand as of today, um, specifically obviously in the, the nonprofit realm, non realm uh, is those individuals who are working for you guys can file for unemployment insurance uh, if they are you know, off because of the coronavirus. I don't think that's any secret. Um, what we're anticipating is some guidance uh, out of the CARES Act bill that was passed last Friday that's going to help alleviate some of that pressure uh, on the charges that are coming back to you. I don't have the specifics on that yet. I think we will uh, by Monday. Uh, and so uh, I'll make sure to get that information back out or if it's a scenario where you guys wanna do another webinar, that's fine, just let me know and we'll try to fit it in. But um, that certainly is on the list of stuff. So essentially what happens is this, <coughs> excuse me, if you're not familiar, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, when you file for unemployment insurance, um, to qualify under normal circumstances, you're looking at the wages that have, you've earned. So a lot of times there's a misconception with people who um, will file for unemployment insurance and they'll tell us and they'll be upset that, you know, if they don't qualify, that they've been paying out, you know, they've been paying for unemployment insurance since they had their paper route when they were a kid. Well, the reality is, is that's the employer contributions that are paid to us on a quarterly basis. And so when an employee uh, goes to file, uh, what happens is we pull up their wage line uh, that has all that data that their employer has reported to us uh, on a quarterly basis and we determine what they're eligible for. We only go back 18 months uh, after every quarter a month, uh, after every quarter that preceding quarter drop or, or last quarter drops off. So we're on this 18 month rolling quarter. Uh, and so, you know, in the nonprofit one, a lot of times you'll have individuals who won't have wages reported on them. Uh, and that's where the CARES Act bill comes into effect. That's going to help qualify a lot of those individuals. Uh, we're waiting for final guidance on that. Again, when the CARES Act bill was approved, it then has to go through the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor will then flush out uh, those guidelines uh, that Iowa and, and all states uh, will have to uh, administer. And that's what we're working on. And so um, I believe we'll have that information out on Monday. What we're telling folks, I'm sure a lot of you um, nonprofits have had your employees have probably called into some of our claimant webinars and we've told them to file. Uh, what will happen when they file and they at least get their claim on the system is that we'll be able to go back and um, um, pay them for what their starting point. Now, there'll be a starting point for all of this stuff. They won't go back, uh, I'm assuming, into 2019. Uh, I imagine a lot of this will be based on um, when the agreement was signed within each state. Um, for us, it was March, like every other state, but uh, that's yet to be determined. So a lot of moving pieces, but we're definitely moving forward. Uh, the first huge wave of folks who have filed for us are starting to get paid, I believe, this week or today. Um, and so it's starting, the, the ball is starting to move a little bit. So I know there's a lot of questions that surround that, but that's kind of where we are as it relates to um, the, uh, the nonprofits. Um, and that includes, uh, I think, government entities as well. They'll be, they'll be put into that boat as well. So uh, the other question that has come up a lot is um, the $600 uh, additional. So uh, if you're not familiar, the $600 is, um, was passed in the, in the bill and it essentially will uh, give individuals uh, a, a, a boost of money on top of their weekly benefit amount. Um, and so uh, there'll be a timeline parameter on that as well. We should have that all ready and ready to go out on Monday uh, or, or Tuesday at the latest. We're still working through some of the specifics all the states are. We're waiting on guidance, quite honestly. Uh, but certainly what we're encouraging for individuals is uh, to, to seek out opportunities to find employment. Uh, one of the things that gets lost in these scenarios is, uh, or, or are the employers who need to fill positions. Uh, and so we have a tendency just to think about that one side that, that are out of work when there's plenty of employers who are, who are trying to fill jobs. And, 
as those employers contact us, we were, we were putting them on our homepage of our website. So uh, a lot still to come. I think we're a whole lot farther today than we were Monday, quite honestly, uh, and certainly than we were two weeks ago. Uh, but next week will really be, will be where we'll be able to, to get into the more of the details of it. Um, so a couple things. Uh, if you're not following us on social media, please do. Follow us at least on Facebook. Uh, for the employers, I've noticed we get a little bit more, we get more followings on Twitter and LinkedIn. I try to put out something once a day on that, uh, when, as time permits, uh, updates and whatever's going on. Uh, the other thing is make sure you're checking the Iowa Workforce Development uh, .gov website. There's a lot of information out there. We're really trying to push to get stuff put into different languages. So if you guys, uh, nonprofits, I know sometimes you'll have uh, you know, I was big on refugees and we have a lot of uh, English as second language. So we're really pushing to get a lot of that stuff updated and out there next week. That's important for a lot of reasons. One, obviously it helps those folks, which is uh, what we want to do. But two, it also helps alleviate some of the calls. So it really frees up the phones for people who absolutely need to call in. Otherwise, we're pushing everybody online. Again, that's iowaworkforcedevelopment.gov. One of the things to remember, this question comes up all the time and it's a very valid one, valid one. Everybody files the same way. You go through the same process. You go through the individual tab on the iowaworkforcedevelopment.gov website and it takes about 30 or, four minute, 30 or 40 minutes to get your claim filed. Uh, and so when you go through that process, after that it triggers uh, stuff that will be sent out to you and to you, the employer, uh, the nonprofit. So, for those individuals, let's say you're at a nonprofit, your folks don't get paid, right? They don't have any wages. They don't have any wages in the last 18 months because remember, we look at all of the employers in the last 18 months, not just one. So in that situation where an individual has no wages reported on them, uh, we would um, be able to, I believe, qualify them under a part of the CARES Act bill as well. Again, that information will come out next week. Uh, there's a lot in there. Uh, a lot more guidance that we're working through. Uh, so um, I think it's safe to say by next Friday at this time, we'll have a really clear landscape on everything, timelines and, and all of that stuff. So uh, at a high level, uh, I know that's a lot of information and, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds of it if we don't have to because it can be a little too confusing, quite honestly, even for people who are working in unemployment. Um, but uh, that's kind of where we stand right now. Any questions on that or Carrie, I, I I defer to you on how you'd like to move forward. I think Carrie might be um, having some issues with her, some challenges um, with her, uh, her sound. So <laughs> I'll just step in real quick, Ryan. Hey, yeah. um, I've had some questions about independent contractors. I know in the sector, um, there are you know a number of executive directors who are contract workers. Um, do you know if there will be any provisions um, for unemployment for them or? There are, yeah, they, they will qualify, they should qualify. Let me, let me back up, I gotta be politically, I wanna make sure I'm politically correct here too. Well, politically is probably a bad word. I, I, I wanna make sure that I'm, I, you know, every situation is unique to itself, but for the most part, yeah, you know, we're trying to qualify everybody that, that files, including 1099. They would fall under that. Uh, it's going to be called PUA, which is uh, an acronym that we are notoriously bad for using, uh, <laughs> uh, which stands for Public Unemployment Assistance. And that is basically the, the part of the CARES Act bill that will help people get qualified that don't have reported wages on them. So absolutely, they will be. Yep. Now, okay. what they qualify for will be will be um, based on what they have their 1099 or their 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 taxes. And so we really are pushing people go out to iowaworkforcedevelopment.gov. That portal is now open if you're in that situation, and you can start taking a look at the information we're going to need to get you qualified. Again, uh, urgency on on uh, to getting that stuff turned in is going to be important. Understanding a lot of people haven't even got their their 2019 taxes filed. That's been taken into consideration on this as well. Mm -hmm. um, another question: What kind of guidance should we be giving to nonprofit employees who have filed for unemployment but received a denial letter? Yeah, so that's a good question. I was just reading that too. So that's that's normal. That's how the process works. I, I know that sounds probably a little harsh, but under normal circumstances, when you would file for unemployment, you would get a monetary statement back that says you do not qualify. 
what we're suggesting in those cases is uh, tell your individuals to keep, uh, just hang on. Uh, as soon as we have this final ga guidance, all those are going into a holding tank and we'll be able to start uh, moving those forward to get them paid. Just have your folks continue to call in and claim their weekly claim. So here's a, the weekly claim can get a little confusing in it and, and, and so I wanna, this is the easiest way to remember. So let's say you filed your initial claim uh, on Monday, this previous Monday, right? Every year you have to file a new claim, which we call an initial claim. It's good for one year. Within that claim, under normal circumstances, you get 26 weeks of unemployment, right? That's going to be expanded out of the CARES Act. But let's say you filed next, let you filed last Monday. This upcoming Sunday, you would report for the week behind you. So, so on Sunday, you're always reporting for the week behind you. So if you earned any wages, you, you would report that. You have to call in and claim your weekly claim every Sunday, regardless of whether you whether you worked or not. And, and you don't call and you do it online, you go right through the portal. Um, so yeah, good question. Just have those folks continue to, to claim their weekly claim because when we can get all this adjusted, we'll go back and all those weeks they have on, they would get paid for. Okay. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. One more quick question for you, Ryan, and then I know we have so much that we could we could talk about um, today. If um, an organization has laid off part-time staff, can they still qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program if full-time staff are employed? So that's a good question. Um, I was just reading the Paycheck, uh, paycheck Protection stuff. Um, I, I need to get back to you on that. Okay. I, I, and I think Angela at the end will, um, she has some insights into PPP okay, as good. well. So um, Angela, maybe when we call you up later, we'll, we'll hold on to that question. So Ryan, um, if you would stay with us, uh, we'll have some more Q&A time at the end. So okay. folks might just be um, processing <laughs> um, some of what you've been saying. So please enter those questions into the Q&A. A reminder, you can do so anonymously um, through that feature. If you um, submit in the chat box, uh, it, it, it'll just be easier if folks can go through the Q&A. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, next, um, I have Lynn Gommer from uh, Senior Gift Planning Consultant with the Stelter Company. She'll address how the CARES Act um, might be impacting donors, and I will invite Lynn to join us um, by video. So thanks, uh, Ryan, if you could stick with us. Lynn? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, yeah, so the CARES Act um, did uh, really create three main changes as it relates to uh, charitable giving. The first one is that it suspended the required minimum distributions for 2020. Secondly, it created a new universal charitable deduction. And three, it lifted the cap on cash contributions for those who itemize. And I wanted to go over a little bit more detail on each one of those. So first of all, on the required minimum distributions, this will come as good news to many of your uh, retirees who will not have to take their distributions this year. Um, but um, on the other front, there is probably a likely, a, we're gonna see a decrease in QCD or qualified charitable distributions this year as a combination of that new rule for 2020 and um, just, the, just the drop in the stock market. But one of the questions I have been getting is, you know, is this still available for 2020? And the answer is yes, um, it is still a viable gift for 2020. Um, there, are, there are going to be uh, retirees who have um, their retirement assets and more conservative investments. And so the drop in the stock market will have um, either minimally or no have no impact on their on their uh, IRAs. So um, so just think about that as you approach um, the your marketing and, and IRAs. The second one is to, it creates a new universal charitable deduction, and I'm thrilled to see that this finally come to fruition. Um, this has been something that uh, leaders in the industry have um, have met on Capitol Hill, have met with their congressional leaders, um, but it creates a new $300 above the line deduction. And there's some. This is. It sounds very simple, but there's been some um, just some. Uh, 
inconsistency on how the interpretation is on this. Um, you know, is that $300, is it per individual or is it per return? Um, I think people are finally starting to think that that's actually $300 per individual. So it could be $600 for married couples. Um, and then timing on this, um, it's a little unclear on how the statute is written. Um, for the most part, this act is for 2020. But the language in this particular section says for tax years beginning after December 31st uh, of 2019. So that kind of lends itself to that this is more of a permanent provision. So as we get um, deeper in, uh, we're only about a week out um, from when the CARES Act passed, I think we'll get some more clarity around these provisions. Um, but this is great for the 90% of uh, taxpayers who do take the standardized deduction. Uh, the final one is the 100% um, the um, AGI uh, limitation. Uh, so if individuals who have uh, cash gifts and itemize their deductions, they are able to um, take a deduction up to 100% of, of their AGI. And um, if it goes over that, then they can carry over um, that remaining amount for an additional five years, but then the the limits the the limits prior to this act, which would have been sixty percent, would then apply. Um, so so those are the three um, three main provisions as it impacts nonprofits and donors. Thanks so much, Lynn. I know that right now everybody seems to be really in survival mode and learning more about these loan opportunities, but absolutely the charitable giving impact is going to have a long lasting effect on recovery. Um, and you are also going to be hosting a webinar next week, I believe, on um, this topic. And we can send out the details to that. That's open to anybody. Um, we can send the details to that in, um, uh, in our follow up. Yes, yes. And you can always go onto the Stelter website um, and register there. But Nathan and I will be hosting a webinar that will go over in much more detail, um, not only the CARES Act, but in marketing during this time. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I am now going to invite Angela Reed um, from Tarbell to um, to join us and Angela has insights. She's been following the CARES Act um, and how nonprofit leaders can be um, adjusting uh, and responding. So Angela, as you join us, I know we have a ton of uh, questions about the Paycheck Protection Program coming in. Um, is that maybe a place to start? I know it was supposed to start today and it, it got off to a start, maybe like our webinar. <laughs> We're all just kind of um, really trying our best right now, but uh, go ahead and maybe just let us know what you know, kind of the latest on that program maybe to start. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay, Brianne? Yep. Okay, Brianne, I don't, how come I've never met you before? I've been down to the Community Foundation. They've been hiding you down in the basement or oh, something? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. Thanks. So I'm going to probably limit my discussion to generally one item today because there's so much and it changes every day. So um, I work at Tarbell and Company, CPA firm here in Des Moines, and we work with a lot of small businesses and nonprofit organizations. So I'm happy to provide whatever insight that I might have. So um, probably over the last week, I've done a lot of reading on one particular thing, and that one particular thing is the um, Paycheck Protection Program um, loan that came about from the CARES Act. So I'm going to limit my discussion as much as possible to that particular item because I feel like I've done a lot of reading on that, and I can speak and answer a lot of questions about that, whereas okay. there's some other things in the CARES Act that I could probably give you a general idea on, but I don't feel like I could carry on somewhat of an educated conversation about it. So I think everybody else has kind of mentioned um, everything changes daily. Um, and this particular um, Paycheck Protection Program forgivable loan, when they first came out with it, had some parameters regarding the loan and it's changed and evolves every day. Even um, the SBA loan application has changed um, 
you know, since yesterday. So I'm going to go over some information and then, you know, if people have questions, I um, can certainly try to help answer those. Um, just provide some information. I'm going to refer to this Paycheck Protection Program as PPP. Um, hopefully most of you have done a little bit of reading about this, um, but just to reiterate, like I have to read or look at something about 14 to 20 times and then I feel like I somewhat understand it. So hopefully this won't be the first time that you've heard or read some of this information. Um, the PPP program um, has to have less than 500 employees in your organization in order for you to qualify. It can be used for a for-profit organization. So any type of entity, S corporation, corporation, partnership, sole proprietorship, and 501c3 organizations, so most charities. If you were a trade association, it's not gonna work for you. Um, but if you've got maybe some employees inside of a you know, foundation that's a C3, might be an option for you. Um, also, food service organizations with an NAIC code of 72, those um, companies can use a physical location um, to stay under the 500 employees. So think about, uh, you know, like a McDonald's. Hey, you got, I don't know, thousands of McDonald's locations. Well, McDonald's falls into an NAIC code um, 72. Angela, I think for, for our nonprofit community that um, that would maybe translate more um, in the affiliates, like if you're, they're part of yep. a national affiliate and the total number of employees that the national um, affiliate employs um, for state networks and, and things like that, is that the yes. relevance in the nonprofit sector? So possibly. Kind of keep in mind the NAIC code has to be 72. So nonprofit organizations might not be able to fit into that code 72. So you think about, a, I'm just gonna use an example like a YMCA, mm -hmm. a lot of different locations, but they're not code 72. When you go look up code 72, it's more like food service, casino, that type of um, entity. So if you've got more than 500 employees in a nonprofit organization in your particular nonprofit, using the PPP could be an issue. Okay. I did also, Angela, sorry, I, I meant to um, add this as you were getting started on the PPP. We did launch a poll just to see um, where our participants are already, um, anticipating that everybody's been thinking about this. So it looks like we have um, about 10% who've tried to apply already, um, and then 40% uh, planning to apply, another 10%-ish um, who think it's not maybe not a fit for their organization, and then about half, um, again, who need to to feel like they need to learn more. So that poll is live. Um, and if you haven't voted yet, give us a, 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 I'll give you a couple more minutes to respond while Angela is talking. So um, Angela, do you, uh, do you want to keep going? And then I can start to ask a, a couple of these PPP questions coming through. Yep. Give me about five minutes and I think I can get through the rest of my okay. tidbits of information. Okay. Um, some other rules, um, must be in business by February 15th, 2020 to qualify for the PPP. Independent contractors and self-employed people can apply. Um, most likely their application process will open up supposedly by April 10th. Um, the PPP is a loan program to start with. It um, is a loan initially, but up to 100% of it can be forgiven. You do not need to be turned down for some other loan in order to qualify. Personal guarantee is not required. No collateral is required. No fees to the borrower. Maximum loan amount is $10 million. There will be $349 billion available nationwide. Most people think, oh my, that's a lot of money. Really, quite honestly, it's not enough. Some people think if all of the nonprofit organizations and small businesses applied, um, we need like three to four trillion dollars. Um, you must apply by June 30th, 2020. The payroll, so the PPP loan is all about payroll and getting some money to nonprofit organizations and small businesses 
because quite honestly, back to Ryan's presentation, I was on a call this morning and it kind of sounds like currently the Iowa unemployment rate is probably up to about 6%. Conceivably, our unemployment rate, I, I just think it could go up to 20 or 30%. Well, the federal government doesn't want 20 or 30 percent of our um, workforce unemployed. So this is what about this is what the PPP program is about: is getting dollars to nonprofit organizations and small businesses for payroll costs. So the payroll costs that you can include in your loan application when you're making the ask for the loan is the gross payroll, group health insurance employer retirement benefits, and something called state or local tax assessed on the compensation, which I haven't quite figured out what that is yet, possibly could be state unemployment, but I would just say leave that off because we don't know what that is. Um, the individual um, payroll costs per employee, you have to cap at $100,000 per employee. The maximum loan amount that you can ask for is the those that payroll costs that you come up with um, for an average month multiply it by 2.5 times so that's the amount of ask that you can do on the loan application Angela, can i can i interject there there yep. are a couple questions about full-time and part-time employees um can you explain a little bit around um you know if part-time employees are included and yep. then some other questions um, on that. If uh, if it's a completely bored, if there if there is no, um, I guess owner. Uh, that th I guess that's a question on the application. Um, is that where a board member would would be um, listed, or can you give any guidance around? Um, so first, part time employees, and then secondly, how should the board be integrated into any of this application process? Okay. So the loan application actually is already out. It came out maybe three days ago, and then yesterday, late in the day or overnight, they updated the loan application online. Um, so if you look at the loan application, there's a place where you put your average monthly payroll cost, and right next to that, it asks you for some about jobs. Well, the jobs are full-time equivalent. So you can count part-time employees, but you have to convert them to full-time equivalents. Um, then the question about who signs the application. So if you look on the application, um, the form indicates that the person that is going to sign it is something called signature of authorized representative of the applicant. I would if it was me, I would presume that probably should be one of the executive committee members of your nonprofit organization. Just personal opinion. Um, so number of jobs, it is full-time equivalent. Um, the period to make the calculation for your payroll costs, if you were instance in 2019, which most of the time it's an organization, that was in existence in 2019, you would calculate this payroll cost based upon your 2019 payroll numbers. So you can use calendar year um, information. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with regards to the payroll calculation, and I won't talk about this too much because some people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but you don't count the sick leave, which you're, you potentially are looking at getting a uh, tax credit for under the Families First Act. So there was a Families First Act that came out a couple weeks ago prior to the CARES Act. A um, couple other pieces of information. If you have an economic injury disaster loan, which most people call an EIDL loan through the SBA, for non-payroll costs, then you can still apply for a PPP loan. Thanks. Um, that, that's a question that has come through. Yep. The other thing about the EIDL loans is if you got an EIDL loan for payroll costs, then your PPP loan must be used to refinance the EIDL loan. And Brianne, I'll give you, like I have like a 
kind of a two page summary of information that I can give you. Yeah. You yeah. We, I think we sent some of your information out in Good. our, uh, in our reminder email and we have a COVID-19 nonprofit resources page on our website. Um, so we're posting, we have a public policy kind of section um, and then also, um, you know, additional information. So that information um, around the previous act uh, that has to do more with um, FMLA um, and and I'm forgetting the name of it uh, with the uh, Families, Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. So there's information on there about um, FMLA and um, family leave um, and and nonprofit organizations and how they might be impacted there as well. So um, I know okay. that's something that you sent out earlier. Okay. Good. I'll get you another PDF copy that you can stick on your website. Probably on Monday, it'll be outdated information, but you never know. <laughs> um, the other thing that I, information that I've gotten from some bankers, when you provide documents for your, for this PPP application, you probably want to provide a copy of your IRS determination letter. Um, if you're a church, you may need to provide a copy of your group exemption letter from with the IRS or maybe a copy of your articles of incorporation. Um, for some nonprofit organizations, you might also, depending on how you're registered with the Secretary of State, you might wanna to go to the Secretary of State's website and print off um, your certificate of good standing. Um, other documentation when you're providing that SBA loan application to a bank, which I can talk a little bit about that too, the documentation for the eligibility on the front end, um, the items that you're also going to want to attach to the application are probably some sort of a payroll process record, such as maybe a payroll summary for 2019, um, payroll tax filings, copies of the four quarters of the 941 for, night, for the year 2019, and a copy of your W-3. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the forgiveness side of it. Um, so on the forgiveness side, to, so to start with, this is a loan. Um, the forgiveness side comes on the back end. And in order to have 100% of the loan forgiven or some portion of the loan forgiven, it's based upon three items. Those three items are in the eight weeks after the loan is given to you. So if I got a loan today, um, I would, the, the clock would start ticking. And in eight weeks, I have to spend that money that was loaned to the organization on, I have four things I can spend it on. I can spend it on payroll cost. And those are actual payroll costs from today forward for eight weeks, rent, utilities, and interest. I have to spend 75% of it on payroll costs. And that sort of makes sense because the reason why they're giving you them or loaning the money to you is because they want these employees back working. They don't want them unemployed. And then the third item that, um, you know, in order to try to get at least partial or full forgiveness is that on June 30th, 2020, and this is a specific date and time, which certainly could be extended depending on what happens, I'm sure out in our real world is that you can't have reduced your full-time employment count by more than 10%. And again, that's full-time full -time equivalent count by more than 10%. And you can't have decreased your payroll cost per employee by more than 25%. And I think this might be per employee. I don't think it's taking your total payroll cost and applying the 25%. I think it might be per employee, which sort of makes sense because they want you to have these employees working, but they don't want you cutting wages to them. So I think it's looking at a per employee cost. An that Angela. one could be a moving target. Yeah. yeah. Can I interject there real quick? Yep. Um, there were a couple of questions kind of related to this. So um, if they end up laying off people after they apply for the PPP, um, how does that affect the forgiveness of the loan was a question. And I think you, you addressed that somewhat. Um, yeah. So I, I'll give you a little bit of information. Like today, if you're a nonprofit organization and you're completely closed down and nobody's getting a paycheck, 
maybe including the director, and you're like, wow, I probably can't apply for the PPP loan. That actually is not true. So the idea behind the PPP loan is to have small businesses and nonprofit organizations continue to pay their employees, or if they've laid people off or cut hours, that by June 30th, 2020, get those people back on your payroll um, and or um, you know, increase their payroll back up to the level that they previously received. So they're gonna give you some time to do that. So if mm -hmm. you're closed down, you kind of have till June 30th, 2020. That's one of the stipulations mm -hmm. for the 100% forgiveness. Yeah. Some things I've been hearing, you know, um, in our sector, we always lament the fact that there's not enough time to do everything that we would like when we're um, conducting our programming. And so, you know, if you are bringing staff back and you're not actively doing programming, what are those kind of, if we only had enough time projects that you can see about your staff doing remotely? Um, I did have another question come through. If a staff voluntarily resigns, does that mean they have to rehire the, the position in order to receive the forgiveness of PPP? And am I hearing right, you were talking about that 10% rule. So um, that might be an instance in which, uh, you know, that they just kind of take that 10%, um, that loss as a part of that 10%, or can you speak to that at all? Yeah, you can. So this is the way I understand it. There's like three factors that go into the forgiveness and one of the big you know one of the big reasons why they're lending you this money is it's all about employees it's all about we don't want our federal unemployment rate to be 20 or 30 percent so the federal government is willing to loan you this money in order to give you some cash flow and what they want you to do with it is either pay your current employees if you haven't laid them off or if you have, get them back on your payroll so that within the eight weeks after you receive this money, you've spent that money on payroll. And the other you know, piece to that is on June 30th, 2020, basically that one day in time, I think there'll probably be a little bit more rules about that, but you've got to get your full-time equivalent count back up within 10% of what it previously was. And there's a couple dates that you look at. And you've also got to get that, that payroll cost figure up for each one of those employees up to no more than 25% reduction to what it previously had been. Thanks. And you can spend 100% of the PPP on payroll. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that was one of the questions. Um, what is the policy for nonprofits that use a PEO for loan documentation? Um, okay. since yep, so we've had, we have a few clients, we have quite a few clients that have actually applied for these PPP loans. Um, and so we also have some clients that use PEOs. And what we've told our clients that use the PEOs is that go to the, so, the information that you need for the payroll costs, you can get, you know, like the last payroll of 2019 that has year to date information on it, has each one of the employee names. You're going to need that piece of information and then ask the PEO for a copy of the state unemployment filing because normally if you're using a PEO, your state unemployment quarterly filing is under your nonprofit's name. And then probably copies of W-2s, you would also wanna get that information. Great, um, I have a question. Can you explain the $100,000 compensation excluded payroll cost? Yep, so <clears throat> this is, and hopefully people didn't read that Des Moines Register article a couple days ago, that article was not very accurate, so don't be reading that. <laughs> um, the $100,000 cap is you can use wages that you pay to any employee under this payroll cost calculation, but each one of those employees' payroll cost wages cannot exceed $100,000. And the payroll cost is gross payroll, group health insurance plus retirement benefit. So you have to cap 
that dollar amount at $100,000. So let's say a community foundation was gonna apply for the PPP loan, which I presume you guys have already done that. If you hadn't, you probably need to get that done by the end of the day. So let's say that Brianne's getting paid probably at least $130,000. <laughs> That's cute, Angela. Yeah, Thank you. I'm just That's cute. You <laughs> and then she's got uh, group health insurance benefits. And let's say that's another, uh, we'll round it. We'll say that's $10,000. And she's, and the employer is also putting another $10,000 into um, retirement account for her. So you add up the 130 plus the 10 plus the 10 and you're like, Brand's getting paid $150,000. Obviously not enough, but it's 150,000. We're gonna cap her wage at $100,000 when we go to make the calculation for the average monthly um, wage for each one of the employees. So we gotta cap her at 100,000 and any other employee at no more than 100,000. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that scenario. <laughs> you gave me a big raise today, Angela. All right. Um, uh, question, uh, let's see, how are you advising your nonprofit clients? This will be the last question I'll just target to Angela, and then I'm going to open it up um, since we only have about 15 minutes left and just take our other panelists and, and make sure we have um, the opportunity for folks to answer questions or ask questions from all panelists. How are you um, advising your nonprofit clients who run their business on volunteers and have been shut down? Is there any relief in this bill for them for lost revenue? I am just going to say no. So really what we've been doing on our end with our clients is the best thing that we can do is, you know, we. We email them information because you can get that out to a lot of people pretty quickly. And then what we've been doing is, hey, let's have a conversation, figure out what's best in your particular situation. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I only spoke about one piece of, you know, the legislation in the Families First and the CARES Act, but there's a bunch of other options in there. Just like, you know, Ryan spoke about, you know, unemployment, we've been talking to our clients a lot about that too. If you're, you know, if you work somewhere and the door got closed or you own a business or whatever the case might be, unemployment is an option to look at. But if you're working with a lot of, you know, volunteers and you're trying to figure out, hey, what's in, <clears throat> you know, the CARES Act or families first that could potentially help me. You know, one of them is, you know, something that Lynn mentioned, which is this above the line deduction for $300 that people can take on their 2020 tax return. And so that's certainly an option to, you know, if you can get donated food, I'm not exactly sure how the $300 is gonna work, but if you can, you know, solicit, you know, that as an option for, you know, donations to your organization, that's certainly something to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll bring Ryan back on mute. Um, and Ryan, you might want to, if I can, I'll try that, um, chime in as well. There is a question then about um, the EIDL. Um, I have all of our panelists unmuted right now, um, and I'll uh, invite you to start your video if you'd like. Um, can you just real quickly, I know we focused on the PPP um, because that was supposed to launch today and we're expecting, you know, even though that deadline is what, June 30th, that the funds would be expended pretty quickly. Um, folks are saying, you know, uh, and I, I heard, I guess on the ride over here that um, some of the bigger banks don't feel like they're ready to process these. They don't have enough information. Um, so I guess that's two questions. <laughs> uh, PPP, it's supposed to be launching, but there have been some issues from what we hear. Um, has anybody successfully applied that you've been working with? And then can you speak to the EIDL a little bit? So I can talk about that a little bit. Is that okay? Oh uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So the PPP loans, yeah, supposedly the SBA, so the PPP loans, you have to apply through a, a bank. You have to provide your application to a bank. Um, generally, most banks are saying, 
we're only going to work with our clients. Um, so you, you really do kind of need to go to your, wherever your organization banks at, that's where you need to go. Um, I would concur that supposedly the application process was going to maybe be open today, but the application is available online. Um, I'm just going to say, I think by middle of the day on Monday, the money's going to be gone if they do open up the application process today. And attach the documents that you think you need, provide that to your banker, and then once the SBA, I call it portal, that's probably not the right term, but once the SBA portal opens up, that banker is going to take your application and I call it stick it in the queue. Well, if you're sitting there waiting, thinking, oh, I'll wait until the uh, app, you know, until the portal opens and then get my stuff to the bank, I wouldn't be doing that because the bank can get your information, kind of take a look at it, make sure it looks like, hey, this is what, you know, because most of the time these banks have a pretty good idea what they think is going to be needed for the application process. They'll have yours ready to go. And so when that um, portal opens up, they'll have yours ready to submit. And, um, you know, so I would still go through that process, you know, have a conversation with your banker, make sure that bank it can process the SBA application. Those applications currently only SBA 7A qualified lenders, and from what I understand, um, SBA express lenders, they're the ones that can are going to have access to this online portal right from the get-go. If you are working with a bank that doesn't have that sort sort of, um, you know, uh, SBA uh, availability currently, they're going to have to go through a process to apply for that, which means, you, you, you know, if you give them your loan application to that bank, they're not going to be able to do anything with it until they get approval from SBA to get into the you know, portal. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the EIDL loans, um, the, the, those EIDL loans were available at the point when Governor Reynolds declared um, state of Iowa a, I don't know what you want to call it, economic disa or disaster. And that happened maybe a couple weeks ago, but EIDL loans are not forgivable. Those are loans you have to pay back. The PPP loan is potentially 100% forgivable. Um, they keep changing the interest rate on it. Currently, the interest rate, if some of the money has to be paid back, like you can't get it all forgiven for various reasons, the payback term is two years and a 1% interest rate factor. Great. And, um I know we are not going to address all of the questions on these national programs um, in this next few minutes that we have, but I can promise to everybody who is listening today, we did attend earlier this week a fantastic call. Um, Carrie was a little bit garbled when she was trying to share about it at the beginning, but we did attend a fantastic call with the National uh, Council of Nonprofits earlier this week that covered um, the PPP, EIDL, um, and some of these other um, national pieces. And so in our follow-up email, which will go to all of you and everyone who registered and couldn't get in today, um, we will send the link to that recording. Um, um, so that, you know, you can dig a little bit more deeply. Angela, we so appreciate your expertise and kind of on the ground experience with this and working with organizations and banks. But, um, you know, I know we won't have enough time to answer everybody's, all of everyone's questions. Um, in the last couple of minutes that we have, um, Ryan, is there anything um, statewide as well um, that you might want to address? Again, I know we were... Um, a little bit uh, uh, pressed on time at the beginning. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, we'll have more guidance next week. I, I know we're, we're just kind of maybe uh, one or two two days ahead, or mm -hmm. um, ahead of where we of where we kind of need to be to put out more guidance, especially for the nonprofits. But I can assure everybody that's coming, just make sure to follow us on social media, check our uh, COVID tab uh, on the Iowa Workforce Development.gov website. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a lot of answers up there. I apologize, I can't, my video is not working for some reason. Okay. <laughs> We but, saw your picture earlier. Oh, um, and spe oh, <laughs> speaking great. of resources, um, Carrie and I are going to follow up with that website, um, mm -hmm. the National Council of Nonprofits link that we'd shared. Um, so we have had some great questions. We appreciate our panelists insights. Um, and um, did you want to, okay, we've got the resources page up here. Oops, let's see, we've got our poll ending. Um, on the Paycheck Protection Program, so that'll let everybody see where everybody is. You're not alone. Whoever, whichever section you fit in here, let's just say you're not alone. Um, and uh, you, we've got um, COVID resource pages on both of our sites. Um, we have information that we'll be sending out about this Salter webinar, um, Angela's info page. Um, we'll be up on our, our site and sent out as well. Carrie, do you want to kind of close out and just talk a little bit about the importance of advocacy in this space as well, to Ryan's point? Yes, and I actually have um, an advocacy related question for Ryan, um, if he would be willing. So we received a question from a larger nonprofit employer, and she was explaining that many nonprofits self-insure their unemployment payments, and because of the new provision in CARES Act that those payments have been increasing by um, $600 per month per employee, that's creating significant challenges for nonprofits who are required to reimburse that 50% to the state. I wondered if you have um, had any conversations at the state level or if you've heard anything in national conversations about potential, uh, you know, relief for specifically nonprofits who are having to deal with this new financial challenge. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's one of the things we're going through. You know, I'm not sure that the uh, $600 payment's going to affect you, though. I think that will be reimbursed that will be uh, paid directly from the feds and you're not gonna have to worry about that um, let me find out for sure on that so that would certainly take care of that i believe that's how it's going to work um, we had something similar to the six for those who remember uh, if you were around unemployment insurance at all during the recession i'm not comparing the two but there are some similarities in a lot of the guidance that has come out at that time they had something similar uh where where uh, the Department of Labor or, or the federal government was, was releasing an additional payment on top of your weekly benefit amount. And uh, it wasn't $600. Uh, it was $25. And then they raised it a couple times, I believe. But I believe that was non deductible So it didn't affect anybody uh, from a standpoint of having to, to, to try to come up to cover that. Let me check on that. It's a very good question. I do know that we're looking at the guidance. Um, they have specifically have some verbiage uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, that is uh, specifically for nonprofits, uh, which include would include not larger nonprofits. So I, I, I unfortunately will have that information next week. We're just a little early, so I will get that and get that back to Carrie if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds great. I know that there are certainly several nonprofits who are you know eager to get that answer and really understand what that financial picture is going to look like for them. So let's, let's be in touch and we'll promise to get that answer out to um, all of the registrants and, and share on our resource pages as well. Um, as Brianne mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna click back a few slides. We were trying to deal with those technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, the National Council of Nonprofits webinar was fantastic. We'll share that out along with the slides. They've also put together this really helpful chart that explains all of the programs through the CARES Act that are available to nonprofits. So if you need a helpful guide, sort of a one-stop um, document to recap all of that information in one place, I found this to be really helpful in understanding the differences, um, which programs you can apply for at the same time, which ones you need to use independently. So please take a look at that. We've included it in the slides, uh, but we'll also share it in our resource links as well. Thanks so much to all of our panelists and to Brianne for helping co-host and organize. Um, it's been really a pleasure to partner on this. Um, a reminder though that the legislation and you know, assistance programs at state and federal level um, will probably continue to come down the pipe. So there is additional advocacy that we need to do. A lot of the things that made it into the CARES Act for nonprofits were a direct result of the advocacy that many of you on the call engaged in. Um, so I know Brianne and our office and Deanne Cook at United Ways of Iowa will continue to um, 
get those issue alerts out as there's additional advocacy levels at the federal level. And certainly um, we're interested in continued conversation with state leaders as well about assistance that we can get to our nonprofit providers who are on the front lines really helping um, all of our communities it, with these tremendous needs that are arising. So thanks for your good work. Um, thanks again to the Community Foundation for the partnership, and we'll be sure to get the resources and links out hopefully later this afternoon so you can continue to access those resources over the weekend. Brianne, anything else you'd like to add? You know, I just want to say to everybody who's out there listening and maybe you're in your home office and maybe you have kids crawling on you or maybe you are heartbroken over, you know, what's happening for your employees and their families right now. Um, you know, you're not alone. Uh, we want to get you the resources that you need and um, be a partner to you. And um, so please reach out to us. Um, I do have, a, again, um, we just released a, a, a nonprofit adaptation grant. I had a question that came in about that. Um, and that, that grant making opportunity is up on our website. Um, we will be sending out these resources, but um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And, and I know Carrie's been serving the ICOF members um, really well over this time. So it's uh, good to share space with you today and we hope to um, see you in real life soon. Brianne, I'm gonna pop in, I'm so sorry. But Ryan was able to get us real-time information about the question on the $600 oh. for the unemployment tax. So Ryan, <laughs> sure. can I have you chime in? Let's end on that response? note. Let's end on an informational yeah. note. <laughs> yeah, so so who, I don't know who asked that question, so forgive me, but that that is, you're not gonna have to worry about that. No, no, none of the employers, no matter what your kind of industry, that, that comes straight from the feds. And, and so that's not something that's gonna have to be reimbursed by the employer. So I, sorry, I guess I did know that. And I went back to my notes just to make sure. So you, sh you shouldn't have to worry about that. Hey, no, hey, no that worries. Is a good news to end on. <laughs> yeah. We'll end on a good news note. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week and weekend. Thank you.